Hey guys, how's it going? Um, I was thinking with the school closure um, for the rest of the school year, I thought that as you read Crime and Punishment, it'd be helpful for me to post a few video lectures. So here's my first one. I'm planning on doing about four in total. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Crime and Punishment because we haven't been able to do that together. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we have read and the significance of it, and then also what you guys will be doing this week. Um, and then going forward, things to be thinking about as you're reading. Again, obviously the best way to study literature is to have an in-person discussion, but I'm gonna try and substitute that with some of these video lectures. And um, this week you have a couple questions due. I'm gonna try and answer your questions in these video lectures, so hopefully we can have a little bit of an interaction that way. Um, so first, I want to talk about what's happened so far. So I had you read all of part one because I think it's really important that you get this introduction to Raskolnikov and what he is doing. Um, most importantly, his murder of the old woman and her sister. Um, and that you got to know a bit about who he is. So one thing that was really significant in part one is that discussion in the bar that he overheard. Um, so there's a student and a young officer that were playing pool and talking about how worthless the life of this old woman was and how she wasn't even doing something. Um, she wasn't even just like existing in society. She was even harming society, right? She was uh, abusing her sister. She was old and mean and she was a usurer. Um, and so uh, Raskolnikov overhears this, right, as he's uh, as he's just been to her and has been disgusted by who she is. And he starts thinking about, well, why not? Why can't someone just kill her? Because she is, she's a louse. She's, um, she's a, a kind of a strain on society. And so we see a little bit of Raskolnikov's philosophy here at the beginning that the ends do justify the means. Um, and we're going to see more of that in this upcoming part that you're going to read this week. Um, then the next part is um, that I want to look at is the actual murder of the old woman. So he is kind of delirious and he keeps going back and forth. Like, how could I even think of such a thing? But like, why not? Why can't I do it? And then when he actually does the murder, he kills uh, the old woman with the blunt side of the ax, which I always find is an interesting detail. Um, and then her sister comes in who wasn't supposed to be there. And so he has to kill her with the sharp end of the ax because he can't have witnesses. Um, but she was never supposed to die in the first place. But then instead of robbing them as he intended to do and to make up with all of their money and make his way in the world, um, he goes through some drawers, some things, but he doesn't get into the strong box that he should have that had all of her money. He just takes a few odds and ends and shoves them in his pocket. And then, you know, we had that whole um, uh, kind of <laughs> that difficult time when he was like trying to get out and then those two people are knocking at the door and he's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get out of here? And the door was open the whole time. Um, eventually he does get out. Um, and then what does he do with the stuff that he stole? He like hides it under a rock. So this interesting part about Raskolnikov is that he's not really in it for the money. Um, kind of in theory he was, but when it actually came down to it, uh, he doesn't actually get the money that he was supposed to get to make his way in the world. But I would say that that the money actually wasn't the main point of him murdering the old woman. And we'll see why kind of later as, um, as you go on. All right. This next part I want to talk about is Marmaladoff and Sonia. Um, so Marmaladoff chapter two, this guy, really horrible guy that he meets in a bar. I find him kind of funny. Um, and he's just talking about how he's a drunkard and how his wife beats him and how he, um, his daughter, Sonia, is prostituting herself so that he essentially can stay and drink, but so that they can, she can feed their family. And now she can't even live with their family anymore because she's a prostitute and the landlady won't allow that to happen. Um, so I want you to pay attention to Marmaladoff and Sonia. Um, and especially... Sonia, who's a super interesting character, because she is a prostitute, but she is really, really sympathetic because 
she didn't want to be a prostitute and she was doing everything she could to not. But then um, her uh, stepmother tells her, like, you're just staying around, eating our food, living in our space. And you're not doing anything. Like, why don't you just go and prostitute yourself? Um, and it's a really heart crushing scene when Sonia does just silently go out and she comes back hours later and just puts the money on the desk and then goes to the bed and starts shivering um, because of the reality of what she's done. And she's um, probably the most religiously sensitive character or the, one of the more moral characters, which is so interesting that Dostoevsky does this um, because she is a prostitute, but she's the most moral character that we have, I think. Um, so this other part I wanna I want you to focus on, especially from the reading this past week, is Dunya Raskolnikov's sister and Lucin, her fiance. Um, and when Raskolnikov first gets the letter about Dunya and Lucin uh, and their engagement, he makes the comparison that Dunya is doing exactly what Sonia is doing, because Dunya, while she is more respectable, she isn't becoming a prostitute. She is marrying a man that she doesn't and can't respect. For, for money, so that her brother, Raskolnikov, can um, finish college, so that he can get a job. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting comparison that Raskolnikov makes, because while you might think that Raskolnikov's crazy and you shouldn't like him, he is a murderer, he is an axe murderer, um, Raskolnikov actually loves his sister a lot. And you can see that kind of in his contempt, but in that he's not going to let Dunya sacrifice herself for him. Um, and so that like this interesting correlation between Sonia prostituting herself for money and Dunya not actually prostituting herself for money, but in a very similar way, giving herself to this man that she can't respect for money. Um, so I want to look ahead. So that's all part one and part two that you read. Now going into part three, you guys are gonna be reading chapters four through six. And so the reason I'm breaking this up, um, I'm not having you read the whole book. It is a lengthy book. I think it's very, it's worth reading if you guys want to. Um, it's also just a super enjoyable book, but I'm focusing in on these specific sections because um, I think you can see the kind of the thread of what Dostoevsky is doing in these specific chapters that I've pulled out. Um, and I want to really focus in on those. Um, so you're just reading these three chapters. Um, and I want, um, I want to talk about a few things, but most importantly, this chapter, um, this section has an amazing conversation between Porphyry, who's the detective on the murder case and Raskolnikov. And there's, there's a few things I want you to pay attention to. But one of them, I want you to be thinking about whether or not you think Porphyry knows that Raskolnikov did it because his conversation is so interesting and he asks very poignant questions. So I think that that's one of the interesting things um, about Porphyry as a character and about this whole section and how Dostoevsky sets this up. Um, so what we learn here is that Raskolnikov has written uh, a pamphlet or an essay and Porphyry has read it and is asking him some questions about it. It gives us a little bit more of Raskolnikov's philosophy about uh, man. So um, I'm going to read you just a couple of passages. And then um, I want you to be looking for these specific passages as you read um, and really enjoy this section. I think it is so, so interesting. Um, I have the Barnes & Noble copy. Um, so it's on page 247. It's in chapter four. Um, so Raskolnikov says, I maintain if, that if the discoveries of Kepler and Newton could not have been made, uh, made known except by sacrificing the lives of one, a dozen, a hundred or more people, Newton would have had the right, would in fact have been duty bound to eliminate a dozen or a hundred men for the sake of making his discoveries known to the whole of humanity. But it does not follow from that that Newton had a right to murder people right and left and to steal every day in the market. Then I remember I maintain in my article that all, 
well, legislators and leaders, such as Lycurgus and Solon, Muhammad, Napoleon, and so on, were all, without exception, criminals, from the very fact that, making a new law, they transgressed the ancient one, handed down from their ancestors and held sacred by the people, and they did not stop short at bloodshed either. If that bloodshed, often of innocent persons fighting bravely in defense of ancient law, were of use to their cause, it's remarkable, in fact, that the majority, in fact, of these benefactors and leaders of humanity were guilty of terrible carnage. In short, I maintain that all great people, or even people who are slightly uncommon, that is to say, capable of producing some new idea, must by nature be criminals, more or less, of course. Otherwise, it's hard for them to get out of the common rut, and to remain in the common rut is what they can't submit to, from their very nature again, and to my mind, they ought not to, in fact, submit to it. So I'm going to skip down a little bit. I only believe in my leading idea that men are in general divided by law, by a law of nature into two categories, inferior, ordinary, that is to say, the material that serves only to reproduce its kind, and men who have the gift or the talent to produce something new. There are, of course, innumerable subdivisions, but the distinguishing feature of both categories are fairly well marked. The first category, generally speaking, contains men who are conservative in temperament and law-abiding. They live under control and love to be controlled. To my thinking, it is their duty to be controlled because that's their vocation, and there's nothing humiliating in it for them. The second category transgresses the law. They are destroyers or, dis or disposed to destruction according to their capacities. The crimes of these men are, of course, relative and varied. For the most part, they seek, in very varied ways, the destruction of the present for the sake of the better. But if such people are forced, for the sake of their ideas, to step over a corpse or wade through blood, they can, I maintain, find within themselves, in their conscience, a justification for wading through blood, which, you should note, depends on the idea and its dimensions. So this part, I think, is really the heart of Raskolnikov's whole idea that we don't get to see the fullness of until this point. That's like halfway through the book. Um, so he is saying, essentially, there are two kinds of people in the world, ordinary and extraordinary. And if you read the little intro page that I wrote out, um, there's a little bit about Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche was a, a philosopher, psychologist, um, who came just after Dostoevsky, but it almost sounds like Dostoevsky is responding to a lot of Nietzsche's ideas um, about this Superman, this Ubermensch, is what Nietzsche talks about. Talks about. Um, so, um, it's really interesting that Dostoevsky addresses this idea, even though Nietzsche came a few years later. Um, so, Raskolnikov is talking about a moral justification for murder and even says that it's a it's a duty to murder people if someone has some new idea that they're going to give to the world. So now I'm going to um, read a little bit of Porphyry's remark to this or response. Thank you, but tell me this. How do you distinguish those extraordinary people from the ordinary ones? Are there signs at their birth? I feel like there ought to be more exactitude, more external definition. Excuse the natural anxiety of a practical law-abiding citizen. But couldn't they adopt a special uniform, for instance? Couldn't they wear something, be branded in some way? For you know if confusion arises and a member of one category imagines that he belongs to the other, begins to eliminate the obstacles, as you so happily expressed it, then... And then this is Raskolnikov's response. Oh, that very often happens. That remark is wittier than the other. And Raskolnikov says, No reason to, but take note that the mistake can only arise in the first category, that is, among the ordinary people, as I perhaps unfortunately call them. In spite of their predisposition to obedience, met very many of them, through a playfulness of nature, sometimes vouchsafed, even to cow, like to imagine themselves advanced people, destroyers, and to push themselves into the new movement, and quite sincerely at that. Meanwhile, the really new people are very often unobserved by them, or even despised as reactionaries of groveling tendencies. Um, so I'm going to let you read the rest on your own, but I wanted to bring to mind that specific passage, because 
Porphyry just points out, right, kind of in a funny way, you can't, how would we distinguish if there really are ordinary people and extraordinary people? How would you distinguish them? Um, and what if an ordinary person thought that they were an extraordinary person? And this is why I think I would make the argument that maybe Porphyry knows that Raskolnikov murdered way before, um, way before this point, or especially because of this conversation. Um, so I hope you guys are really enjoying this book. I think that it is so, so interesting. And I'm really excited for you to read this section in particular um, because you really do get Raskolnikov's philosophy and how he's trying to justify murder. Um, obviously, that is always at the back of your mind, even when if you are following along with Raskolnikov and you're like, oh, I could kind of see what he's saying. Um, he's always trying to justify murder, which obviously is wrong. Um, so that's the thing I want you to be looking for in this section as you read is how does Raskolnikov try to justify this murder? Um, and where is he, uh, where is he wrong? Um, just a couple of quick things before I close this out. I want you guys to think about um, Dante in regards to Dostoevsky. So when we were reading The Inferno, we talked a lot about Contrapasso, right? That the punishment must fit the crime. Obviously, the title of this work is Crime and Punishment, and I like reading them um, together and talking about them together because you're talking about very similar ideas. Um, so I, one of the things that I like talking about or like having you guys think about is what do you think the punishment of this novel is? Obviously, we know what the crime is. Um, I, so I just want you to be thinking about um, what is the title? What is uh, the punishment of the title? Um, and finally, uh, this week you guys have a, um, a worksheet that will be due on Thursday. And this is um, looking at whether or not Raskolnikov is a hero or an anti-hero. And I'll, um, I've posted that worksheet on Plus Portals. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts. Bye, guys.